Hello everybody, I'm Grant Boxleitner. Thanks for joining us for our SNN Candidate Forum. Tonight, we will be focusing on the District 72 State House race. Republican challenger Ray Pilon is here, along with Democrat incumbent Margaret Good. I'll be joined on the panel by Herald Tribune political editor Zach Anderson. Candidates, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we'll start with opening statements. We flipped a coin earlier to see who would go first. Representative Good, you have one minute. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Margaret Good and I am the state representative for Florida House District 72. I decided to run because I saw this great divide between what Floridians actually want and what our legislature is giving to us. For 20 years, we've had one party Republican rule in Tallahassee and what have we gotten? We've gotten polluted water, we've gotten underfunded public education, we've gotten two and a half million Floridians without access to affordable health care. But there's good news. That we, and that's that we can change that. We can strengthen our water quality standards. We can invest in our public education to make sure that our students have the opportunity to thrive. And we can work hard to make sure that our local economy is strong for everyone. Um, I have the energy and the commitment to serve and I would, would so appreciate your vote on November 6th. Thank you. And Mr. Pilon, one minute to you. Well, thank you very much. And good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ray Pilon, and I was your state representative in District 72 between 2010 and 2016 when I left to run for Senate. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we had somebody that decided they didn't like the job that won, and they quit. So here we are again. Fast forward. It's very interesting to me because, you know, I'm a former law enforcement officer. I raised my family here. I've lived here since 1975. I have experience both in the community, both in community service, both everything I've done as a matter of fact has been for the love of this community. And it's interesting, I haven't been in the house for two years, I guess things really went bad since I left, so I'm anxious to get back because the fact is, is that when we talk about things like water quality and the pollution and we've been hit with an October surprise uh, with the recent hurricane of Michael and before that the red tide and the blue algae. So we've got a tough road ahead of us when we get to Tallahassee, but I'm up to the challenge and I'm asking for your vote on November 6th. Ray Pilon, thanks. Mr. Pilon, thank you, and we'll go to questions now. Zach, you'll start us. Representative Good, Hurricane Michael has caused catastrophic damage to parts of the Florida Panhandle. Before the hurricane, there was some reporting on how difficult it is for many people to evacuate, especially poor people who may not have a car or other resources, yet some communities have no safe place for people to shelter close to home. One rural county didn't even have a storm shelter rated to withstand a Category 4 hurricane. Should the state be doing more to help people evacuate and to help communities build stronger shelters. <clears throat> well, you know, you look at what happened with Hurricane Michael and then you look at what happened with um, Ir Irma last year and it's clear that we need to look at how we deal with these environmental disasters. We need to start planning for them in real and effective ways. We need to look at the um, our infrastructure to make sure that we have buildings that can withstand those storms. And then we need plans in place to make sure that there are evacuation routes and that people that don't have cars or that can't to get to an evacuation route can find a safe place. Representative, or, uh, Mr. Pilon, <coughs> same question. You know, some communities, when they're building new schools, they don't even build them to be rated to the highest hurricane standards because uh, of the cost. Should the state be doing more to help uh, these communities? Well, first of all, let's, let's look at Michael as, as being an anomaly. This is a storm like no other storm, Every, you've heard this on the news. And what, what happened was uh, nobody anticipated that it would grow as fast as it did. Well, they, we now know that it can. Now after uh, Andrew in 1992, and we were talking about this before, the South Florida Building Code uh, was upped tremendously to stand 155 to 200 mile an hour winds. The panhandle was not required to do that. They haven't had a storm like this in 100 years. So we always learn from our, we always learn from our, our incidents that happen. So now, yes, we can plan for the future because we know they can hit anywhere. 
even in rural communities. Now, does the state have a role? The state has a role, definitely, with the locals. But it's first and foremost your local governments, and then some of them are fis fiscally constrained. So when it comes to schools, for example, we already know that the $4 billion we have in reserves are going to have to go to redo some of that infrastructure. And when we do it, it will be built better. Transportation is an issue, and we can work with the local government and those areas, schools particularly uh, with capital funds. And that's what's going to cause us a real real tough session next year to see how much we can help and uh, get involved with the local governments that can't afford it. Mr. Um, Peel, that's your time that. on that question. Well, good. And, uh, we will, uh, I didn't know we had times on this question. <laughs> we will push forward. I apologize. Uh, I have a question for you, Mr. Pilon. Medicaid expansion has been debated in Florida since Governor Rick Scott first said he wanted it before saying he didn't. What is your position on Medicaid to help supplement health care in the state? Well, Medicaid, Medicaid uh, definitely needs to be expanded. And my opponent and has said the same thing. But here's the problem. The bill that Governor Scott um, said he didn't want after he found out the facts, like the rest of us in the legislature, was one that came out of the Obamacare. And that was when the $90 million was going to come to us for 10 years, and then we'd be on our own. Well, there's one problem with that statement, we as a legislature decided we didn't want all of Obamacare and the courts allowed us to back away from it. So we decided that we, well, we didn't decide, we could not then take those full funds. Here's the other issue, real quick. Those funds have extreme, extreme strings attached to them. In our area, Florida, we have a different demographic than Montana. We have elderly, we have disabled that are in nursing homes, and we have single families. But under the Obamacare federal guidelines, and the federal guidelines are still there, we have to give dollars disproportionately to adult, able-bodied, working people. If my plan is simply to go to a, uh, to a uh, grant uh, that allows us then to determine where that money should go where the most need is. Representative Good, uh, same question to you, and we'll give you a little extra time to answer. Thank you. Uh, I think that Medicaid expansion is a no-brainer. There are two and a half million Floridians without access to affordable health care. If we were to expand Medicaid, almost a million Floridians would have access to health care. Ninety percent of the money that we would be spending to get Medicaid, excuse me, Medicaid, um, would it comes from the federal government. It's taxes that we are already paying. And if you look at other states that have expanded Medicaid, then you see that there's a net positive revenue that comes into the state after expansion. So it's good for our bottom line as well. There is no reason not to do it to make sure that this most vulnerable population has access to health care. Okay, Zach. Uh, Mr. Pilon, a recent report released by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said the world must take, quote, rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society to avert catastrophic levels of global warming. The largest source of carbon emissions is burning fossil fuels for electricity and transportation. Do you agree that climate change is a problem? And if so, do you support efforts to force electric utilities to generate more energy from sources that don't relate release carbon emissions? <clears throat> well, I don't believe in forcing anybody to do anything as a government, but here's, here are the facts. Uh, we all know there's climate change. We know that it occurs naturally. I mean, this storm, for example, back in the 1800s, we had one just as bad. So there are cyclical effects. Now, we all have to agree that we can do what we can as humans and to you reduce... You don't think there's man-made causes for climate no, I'm change? I'm getting there. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you have those things that are added. Well, let's look what's been done already in the United States, because the rest of the world, even with the Paris Accord, is not doing it. What have we done? Power companies are now relying more on natural gas than they are fossil fuels. They're, they're also building solar at a rapid rate. Coal burning is now scrubbed. The EPA rules may have been reduced, but I don't particularly agree with it, because the coal industry is still viable, and it can be cleaner coal. So it's a combination of things that we have to do to supply the energy we need and be self-sufficient in this country. But the rest of the world has to jump in big time because the United States is doing a pretty good job and we've got a, a long ways to go. Representative. Representative Good, we will definitely hear from you in a moment, but we are going to take a break. More of our candidate forum in a moment. 
Welcome back to our candidate forum. And Zach, you were asking Representative Good a question. Representative Good, picking up on the issue of climate change, I know you've expressed concerns about climate change and what's happening to our planet. Do you support efforts to mandate that electric companies generate a certain percentage of their energy um, from renewable sources that don't uh, release carbon emissions like uh, the Democratic candidate for governor, Andrew Gillum, is proposing? And if so, what would you say to those who worry that this would be costly for average Floridians and increase their electric bills? Well, we have lived for the last eight years with a governor who did not even believe that climate change was real. We need to start taking climate change seriously. And one of the things that we need to do is really look at our growth management laws and make sure that we are preparing for our infrastructure so that we can withstand the effects of climate change. We also need to look at renewable energy sources and make sure that we are moving as rapidly as we possibly can towards solar energy, towards renewable energy resources because that's the way that we can continue to live in Florida for future generations. All this stuff does have a cost, though. Florida has traditionally been an affordable state. How, how do you uh, see that trade-off? <clears throat> well, look, we just passed the biggest budget in Florida's history, but it's a matter of priorities. We need to fund the things that are priorities to Floridians, and that's a healthy environment, that's public education, that's making sure that every Floridian can succeed, and, with that, and those are the things that we should be focusing on. Thank you. Let's talk about education now. A recent survey said Florida is one of the worst places in the nation to be a teacher. Mr. Pilon, how will you approach educational funding? Well, educational funding is required under the Constitution by, uh, by our Constitution, and it says we'll give an equal amount per student throughout the state. In areas like Sarasota, we have the advantage of having a great system but we have the disadvantage of being a donor community so that everybody shares. That's how the state set it up, so that the haves can give to those uh, disenfranchised or smaller communities that don't have the funds uh, to pay their teachers because that's where most of the money comes from, the per student uh, uh, allocations that we give. So teachers deserve all the credit in the world and should be paid whatever they're worth but the system we have now has to go away. We have a system, and I disagreed with my leadership on it, that says that you're a teacher, your SAT scores when you were in college uh, determine what your bonus or raise is gonna be. That's ridiculous. It should be based on merit, and especially in those schools where they're, uh, they're not performing and they get a C or a D or an F, those are the schools that should get more money and those teachers should be able to then allow those, th those grades to be done on a merit basis. In other words, if you are in a less performing school and your students perform 10% better, isn't that just as good if you're in a great performing school and they do 10% better? Mr. Pilon, thank you. And Representative Good, what's your approach to education? Well, so depending on where who you look at florida pays teachers about 42nd worst in the country we need to make sure that our education system is adequately funded and that includes paying our teachers what they deserve if you look at um, our sarasota we are one of the best public education systems, the best school district in, in Florida, but 30% of our third graders still aren't reading at grade level. And if you go out to Arcadia, 70% of their third graders aren't reading at grade level. This is a real problem, and the way that you solve that problem is by adequately funding our public education system and paying our teachers what they deserve. And what's been happening in Florida is this systematic move to privatize our public education system. We are spending almost a billion dollars on this voucher program, much of that money goes to for-profit charter schools and private voucher schools. That's not right. That money needs to go into our public education system. Zach, your question? So each of you have tried to position yourselves as centrist to some degree while painting your opponent as maybe more extreme than they let on. I want to drill down on your records a little bit. Representative Good, your opponent criticizes the vote you took against a big school safety bill that includes new gun control measures, including $400 million for, to protect public schools and a guardian program that allows teachers, uh, school districts to arm certain school employees, including some 
teachers. That bill attracted bipartisan support. Uh, Ten Democrats in the House voted in favor of that bill. A lot of people looked at it as a compromise bill. Why did you vote against it? First and foremost, and fundamentally, I am against arming educators, and on principle, I could not vote for that bill. But beyond that, there were so many problems with that bill. As we have seen this past summer, our school district really struggled to implement a lot of the mandates, including the school safety measures to, that required ha having an armed personnel on every single campus because we didn't have the funding for it. And so with that, coupled with arming educators, made it a bill that I just could not vote for. Mr. Pilon, your opponent has really criticized your environmental record and noted a number of votes that you took um, that she says would have, have had bad environmental consequences. One of those votes was for a bill that would, uh, would have abolished local fertil fertilizer restrictions, including Sarasota County's ordinance limiting fertilizer use in the rainy summer months. That ordinance was adopted to pre prevent fertilizer runoff from getting into the water and contributing to algae blooms like the current red tide algae bloom. Why vote to take away one of the tools local governments have used to fight these blooms? Well, first of all, I didn't. Um, I, if the other bill had passed, I had Sarasota and all the other counties that had their own local fertilizer ordinances grandfathered in. But the bill that you voted for in committee would have abolished all the local ordinances if it had no, passed. <clears throat> no, because, because in that bill, would have been, if we had succeeded, a grandfather clause. So as you can see, um, when we moved that forward, it was not the worst thing in the world to have it go to IFAS and the University of Florida with the highest, the highest fertilizer uh, regulations uh, in, in the state because they're aimed at agriculture. So that's why I voted for it. But here, here's well, I, the, I just want to be clear, though, no, there no, wasn't a grandfather clause. If you look at the bill summary. All right, let me, let me ask you this. Yes. Does, Sarasota, does Sarasota still have a fertilizer ordinance? They do. They end, do, because the bill of, failed. End, <laughs> end, end, of our, end of our discussion, and I'm very happy that they do. So let me, let me talk about the other, the other part of it, uh, because my opponent seems to go off base with her questions and go into a, a lot of other things. First of all, let's talk about the environment and what I did do. We, have, we actually have tens of millions of dollars being poured into solving red tide right now. We have billions going to fund water projects to dam, for, the, for the damage that's been in, done in the, bath, in the past. And my, myself, I myself have gotten tons of dollars when, when we're talking about the Philippi Creek restoration, the septic to sewer program, the Donna Bay restoration and working with the NEP on our bay to get the grasses back. So I'll stick with all my votes because you know what the real factor is? If you're not there, and she wasn't, and you don't know how the system works, then you can't criticize. In fact, she never came to my office once to complain about it, and I had my office there every day of the week. So I don't, I'm not buying all this, this spin stuff. We can criticize each other. And as far as gun control goes, if what she had proposed people, that she voted against it yesterday, she said because of universal background checks. And then she said in another uh, debate or another conference that she voted against it because there was no ban on assault rifles. And then she said originally it was because it was an unfunded mandate. But whether the schools got enough money or not, Senator Galvano, who's going to be our Senate president, has promised that we're going to revisit it. But if her side had prevailed, her vote and her reasoning, you would not have your own police department at the Sarasota County School Department, School Board. You would not have those law enforcement officers coming to the table to supplement that. You would not have mental health counseling. You would not have the grant that was just given to Sarasota School Board to be able to teach teachers and students how to recognize those signs. Mr. All Pino, of that would gonna, not happen. We're going to get back to the debate. Uh, Representative Good, you'll have a chance to respond to this right after this. We're going to have one more question in our closing statements in a moment. And this is our final segment, and Zach, uh, you were addressing... Uh, Representative Good, Mr. Pilon was making a point about gun control when we went to break. The bill, that, the school safety bill that passed, did have some of the most far-reaching gun control provisions that have passed in the Florida legislature in decades. Those weren't good ideas in your mind? 
Well, it's not to say that they weren't necessarily good ideas. The problem is they do not have any teeth without a universal background check requirement. And this is one of those things. It's a great, it's one of these great divides that I talk about. 96% of Floridians want universal background checks. They think it's a good idea. But when I brought the a universal background check amendment onto the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Safety Act, it was voted down on party lines. That's not right. And without the universal background check requirement, then raising the age to purchase guns from 18 to 21 has no teeth. Banning bump stocks has no teeth. Changing the waiting period from three days until, until you get a background check has no teeth if you don't have to get a background check. So I, these, these gun safety measures, as they are calling them, are ineffective without universal background checks. And with respect to the environment, I just want to take one moment. I think it's really important that we understand what our legislator, legislature legislator has done in the past, and we need to hold them accountable. And if you look at Mr. Pilon's record while he was in the legislature, you will see that he voted against environmental regulation after environmental protection for, for the entire six years he was Representative there. Representative Good, thank you very much. Um, so we are going to have to go now to our closing statements. It'll be one minute each, and, and we'll start with Mr. Pilon. Thank you, and thank you again for having us tonight. It's been uh, one of those good debates, and I like to have debates, not just forums. First of all, a um, couple of quick things. How much time do we have on this one? A minute? Okay. 96% of what said they wanted it? I don't know, because I have never seen the figures. But let's, let's look at this election. Let's look at the fact that uh, her governor uh, candidate wants to raise the income tax to get a billion dollars for her school program. That will devastate the economy. It will stop the growth that we've done. All I want to do is keep, keep Florida and particularly Sarasota moving forward. I'll stand by my record because everything that she looked at, like I said, she wasn't there. She doesn't know what really happened. She doesn't know the outcome of the bills. It's all just what you can read in a yes or no vote. But here's the deal. Who's more experienced? We both want the same things. We talked about it tonight. However, who has a better chance of getting something done based on what you tell me? And when I'm a representative, I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, you come to my office and they have for years. Representative Good, you have a minute. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for holding this debate to my, tonight. I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, my name is Margaret Good, and I think there's a clear choice here. We can move Florida forward or we can go backwards. When I campaigned for the special election, I said I was going to work for our public education system, and I have done that, just that. I have spoken out against voucher programs and worked to fully fund our public education system. I said that I was going to work for our environment, and I voted against the it to tap bill and push Governor Scott to veto it. And I am fully in support of land preservation. I said that I was going to be transparent and accountable, and I have done that. I've held seven town halls. I've moved the district office into the district. I have the energy and the commitment to serve, and I would appreciate your vote on November 6th. And we want to thank our candidates, Ray Pilon and Representative Margaret Good, for debating the issues on SNN. A reminder, make sure you vote. The election is November 6th. Thanks for joining us.